Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Government Summit COVID-19 Government Webinar Series. Today's session is titled, The Impact of COVID-19 on Startups and Ecosystems. I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Frederick Sikre, Executive Advisor from the World Government Summit Organization. Thank you very much, Reem. Um, and hello to everybody who is uh, with us today for this um, very important session uh, for the World Government Summit, the issue of entrepreneurship is um, one that we care about a lot. In fact, it is the second session that we have on innovation and entrepreneurship um, in this uh, COVID-19 series that we've been uh, putting on uh, for the last couple of weeks. And uh, today we have um, really the great fortune of having two um, uh, respected, globally known, iconic um, entrepreneurial um, uh, mentors, they're entrepreneurs in their own sense. Um, and I think we're gonna have a, a very uh, interesting conversation um, with uh, our two uh, guest speakers. Um, and at the same time, uh, later on, we're also gonna go and talk to a few, uh, one or two entrepreneurs that are on the ground um, and, and bring them into our conversation as well. So I'd first like to introduce um, Linda Rotenberg, who is the uh, co-founder of Endeavor. Um, she started that uh, organization in 1997. Hi, Linda. She's talking Hello. to uh, Cape Cod. Um, normally, she's headquartered in, in, in New York, uh, where she created uh, Endeavor, which is a platform that identifies and scales um, what she has called high-impact entrepreneurs. Um, and uh, today she's operating in 38 markets, including Argentina, South Africa, Italy. Um, interestingly, uh, seven states also in the United States of America that are benefiting from Endeavor uh, presence. Um, as I said, you're headquartered um, in, uh, in New York, but the idea uh, of- And uh, Oliver Mina. Huh? And Oliver Mina. And Oliver Mina as well, absolutely. You're all in the Middle East. And um, although you're headquartered in New York, the idea of Endeavor came to you in a taxi in Argentina. So maybe you'll want to tell us a little bit about that uh, as well. Um, you've got, I think the uh, Endeavor entrepreneurs are responsible for about 3 million jobs. Is that it? Um, 4 million now, yeah. 4 million now, okay. And, um, and about over 2,000 entrepreneurs have been, um, have been selected into the Endeavor stable. I know Tom Friedman has said in one of his articles that it is harder to become a, um, a Endeavor entrepreneur than to get accepted into Harvard. Is that right? It is. <laughs> okay, great. So we're looking forward to, to talking with you, Linda. And I'd also like to bring on uh, Fadi Gandur. Um, Fadi, who's another uh, globally uh, recognized uh, entrepreneur, um, who's uh, the founder of Aramex, um, the large uh, distributor and, and logistics company. Um, which he started in 1982 in Jordan. Uh, Tom Friedman spoke about you too um, in his book, uh, The World is Flat, uh, when uh, he was talking about how this small Jordanian company became um, a global brand with 14,000 employees, revenues of over $1.2 billion. Um, and uh, most recently, not really recently, um, but for some time, you also created Wanda Capital which is um, investing into entrepreneurs uh, across the Arab world, into Africa also, um, and a little bit in Europe. And uh, I also saw a little bit in, in the US. Um, and so um, we're delighted to have you uh, also with us. Thank so I think entrepreneurship is extremely important. Um, uh, a study suggests that there's about 600 million entrepreneurs in the world, which would mean that about one in 13 people on the planet, if you take the world population at 7.6 billion uh, people, about one in 13 people uh, are, are running their own businesses. Um, it's at the core of making our economies thrive, healthy um, entrepreneurs create jobs. We know that small and medium-sized businesses are, are the great uh, employment factor in, in, a, in our world. And, um, it's a central issue for all of us because we're confronted with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship every day, whether you're an investor, whether you're a customer, whether you're a family going off on a travel and tourism trip, not most likely recently, but 
hopefully soon again, but we're constantly confronted to entrepreneurs uh, every way we walk, every way we work, and it's also all over the world. Um, it can be in the richest parts of Africa, in the poorest parts of Africa, in Latin America, uh, in our cities, in our small villages. So entrepreneurship is, is really um, a, a critical uh, factor of, of our societies. And this uh, pandemic um, has come upon us, has thrust um, a lot of pressure, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty um, for, for business leaders, for investors, for entrepreneurs who are having to uh, ensure often uh, with little means and especially the startups, um, uh, the continuity of their businesses. So we'd like to talk about some of these things with, with, with both of you. Um, I would like to encourage also our audience uh, to uh, pipe in your questions. There's a chat box. You can send your questions, tell us where you're from, because that's always interesting for us uh, to understand uh, which geography, country you're, you're, you're uh, dialing in from. So before we get into this, um, I just wanted to start us off talking about questions with a poll. We're going to actually ask you out there who are uh, listening to us with, with a question um, and, and we're going to bring the poll up right now. Um, and what we're going to be asking you is, um, how will the post-COVID-19 world impact entrepreneurship? Um, is that impact going to be negative? Is it going to be positive? Or do you think um, nothing really is going to change? So we'll let you vote um, on, on that uh, series of questions. And um, as you do that, I'm... Before and before we get into the, the area of entrepreneurship proper, um, I thought it'd be interesting to ask uh, you, Linda, and you, Fatty, and starting with Linda, um, you know, you, you've been both running businesses for, uh, big businesses for 25, 30 years. You've You're not been, that old. <laughs> huh? You're not, no. But yeah, I'm trying to find the average age between five and you. <laughs> um, so what kind of crisis have, you know, you've been through crises before. Um, what have you learned from these crises in the past? What's important in terms of leadership when you're running a business that is no longer a SME, but that is really a proper business? And maybe also what is different this time around? Well, it's wonderful to be here with all of you, with two of my favorite people uh, in Fred and Fadi. Um, I believe this crisis is different from anything we've ever seen because we are all globally experiencing the same thing at the same exact time. That almost never happens. You know, I always say that when economies turn down, entrepreneurs turn up. And I believe the same is for leaders as well. So just two examples from my own recent experience. One is Endeavor has 500 employees worldwide, 40 of whom are in, the, in, in our headquarters. And our managing directors around the world manage these 38 affiliates sort of semi-autonomously. So I would see team members maybe once a quarter as I was in their various regions. Now we meet weekly as teams. So I think this is an opportunity for leaders to get closer, more connected to people around the world that, that are in their organizations than ever before, because you don't have to jump on a plane to, to be with them face to face. The other thing is, I think it's a time when you have to reimagine your entire business model. In our case, as you both know, well, the heart and soul of Endeavor are our international selection panels where we select the next class of Endeavor entrepreneurs. I just come back from one in Riyadh in February when COVID hit, and we had scheduled to have uh, eight more during the year in, in New York and London and Bali and Milan and Nairobi, et cetera. And suddenly none of these were possible. And as everyone else was canceling live events, we said no. We're not canceling anything. We're gonna reimagine these virtually, but we have to find a way, not just, just to plunk them on Zoom as is, how do we reimagine using the technology to create the senses of community and connection and collaboration? So I think these are really opportunities for leaders to A, show up and B, reimagine their entire businesses. So Fadi, um, Linda um, has mentioned um, those two points about being, you know, Overcoming the difficulty of not being able to come together uh, virtually to be closer to your employees, to your customers. Can you talk about that? And can you also talk maybe throughout past crises where you didn't have that facility maybe that we have today, like with Zoom and, and all these things? 
thanks, Fred. Uh, great to be here with you, with Linda, at the World Government Summit. Look, uh, I am going to uh, add a little bit, uh, some years more uh, uh, earlier than Linda's, since I am much older than she is, and uh, and tell you tell you, look, we my business, which which I've started uh, out of Jordan, as you said, and mostly in the early years, spent most of my time in the Middle East building that business. As you know, we are here. We are in a region that is continuously facing a, a challenge of, of a crisis, uh, either in a city or in a country or in a in a region. What uh, and but never, uh, as Linda said, have we seen anything that is uh, so global at the same time. So even the safe, where you could move to a safety place that you couldn't have in in the COVID uh, crisis. In my experience and what I've done over the years, as as I faced various crises as a CEO of a business. Uh, look, the most important thing was to always, always give comfort to your people. It is, you know, the biggest challenge of, of crisis and of businesses, specifically when they are just uh, maybe starting or growing or even, even big businesses. Uh, there is that impression that the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to fire people. Well, that's, the, that's not the first thing that you should do. The first thing that you should do is actually talk to your people, give them comfort, have complete transparency, completely put all the issues on the table and have a dialogue with them. Tell them what you're feeling, get a feel from them of where they are coming from and have that dialogue about frugal management. How do we manage? How do we stretch our dollars? How do we remain uh, alive? Because you know, cash flows get affected when businesses are, uh, are in crisis. So share with them, tell them what you're gonna compromise. What do you expect back from them as a compromise? thinking about the overall survival of the organization and them in it, because organizations at the end of the day are people. And, and so, so that's, uh, in my view, that's what gave me uh, uh, as a CEO, as a leader of the organization, the credibility that I had in my organization. That's when people thought, oh, okay, here we have somebody we could trust. So because I had their back, they would have my back. Not only in crisis, what matters is how do they feel after the crisis? How does the organization emerge from that crisis? And that's the most important thing that you need to do. Uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, uh, uh, other than talking to, you, uh, uh, to your people, uh, Fred, in a nutshell, you need to remain relevant. You need to remain relevant with your people, with your organization, with your stakeholders, with your clients. You need to have a, a similar dialogue with your clients. They are facing their own challenges. How can we solve your own uh, problems? How can we be more entrepreneurial about how we do things? How can we be opportunistic? Where's the silver lining? What can we do in our infrastructure that we've built over the years that helps other people and other uh, organizations and our clients? Again, the client will remember you when you are there for them during crisis. Your stakeholders will remember you when you are there during crisis. Everything I tell people now and I took all the years of experience that I had, and we, you know, we've, we've invested in, in tens of companies over the years. I put that experience in front of them and told them, this is what is going to make you or break you at the end of the day. Because when you are, and I've had that discussion with Muna, which you will talk uh, uh, to later, and she's done fantastically during the crisis. The critical element is how do you take the stress test that you've gone through uh, a severe stress test that you've gone through in the crisis and actually take a lot of those habits when the crisis is gone, because that's when you are going to find yourself in a different organization. And just as, as, as Linda said, you will pivot and you will continue to be relevant post crisis. That's what matters because crisis will move on. We hope so. It's, they're not going to stay with us all the time. So how do we actually uh, uh, get ourselves into a place where, where people understand that, that, that ecosystem and that stakeholder network remains intact. That's so. Yeah, Fadi, you talked about transparency, about trust. Um, um, Linda, Fadi also mentioned, I think, the notion which I found really interesting of uh, of co ownership with your employees, with your with your stakeholders, um, making them feel that they are part of the solutions that need to be found. Is that something you've experienced too in Adev in Endeavor? 100%. I think this is an opportunity for every stakeholder. We always talk about financial equity. I always talk about psychic equity, and they can be part of the solutions if the leaders bring them in. 
And I think one of the things we're seeing is that COVID is really just accelerating trends that were already happening. And so I think that one of the jobs of leaders is to say, okay, let's look out three years, five years, and where do we need to be now in order to meet that those new realities? So three just trends we're seeing and how entrepreneurs, I'll use examples of Endeavor entrepreneurs in the Middle East are handling this. One is everything's going digital now. And we see this where um, if you're a retailer, you better figure out your digital plan soon if you don't already have one. We have a, um, a large company, White's in, in Saudi Arabia retailer that has really pivoted and moved online. We have a company in, the, in Dubai, Iowa, that is selling glasses and they are helping brick and mortar companies figure out how do they pivot their business models online. Because if you're not digital, you're, you're in trouble. I think the second thing is we're seeing the rise of health tech you know, companies. And this is really important as we had companies like Altibi and Visita, um, one in Jordan, one in Egypt, creating the national crisis hotline, giving access to information, giving access, right, to, to, to healthcare that wasn't there before. We have a company, Proxime, um, founded by a female entrepreneur based out of in, in Lebanon that is actually zooming into uh, hospital rooms where some of the, the doctors can't be present to have telehealth. Um, and the last is we see with online education. And so in the case of Endeavor companies, you have Madua in Jordan and Noon Academy and Klesera in Saudi Arabia that are offering free online services. So to Fadi's point, A, it's about going digital and using these trends that were already happening, but B, it's about providing these services. In each of these cases, these are people providing often free services to help people get through this crisis. And if you do that with your clients, if you do that with your employees, they will never forget it. So I think this is not the time to be greedy. This is the time to be smart and fast. But to your earlier point, if we can co-create the future together with our stakeholders and our employees, Fred, they're never going to forget it. Okay, so um, that, that's ex exactly where I thought we, we should go is to talk about um, the pandemic and, and the, the, the sort of the impact it's had on entrepreneurial ecos ecosystems. Um, and um, and you, you mentioned the three trends of digitalization and health tech, um, that in particularly that have been that have been highlighted, uh, accelerated. Um, before we continue in that direction, I thought it'd be interesting to see the results of the poll, um, and and just see what what we get there. Um, if we can get a view of what our audience there. Okay, so. Look at that. We've got a lot of Real entrepreneurs, not investors. Yes. Investors are all negative. <laughs> the entrepreneurs are always positive. We've been glad to see entrepreneurs are listening. <laughs> well, I hope I hope some investors are also there positive because uh, we're going to be speaking about them later. But OK, so majority uh, are positive um, about the entrepreneurial ecosystems post COVID. That's that's fantastic. Um, so uh, this great accelerator that um, that Linda talked about, Fadi, um, is um, that that's one element of the uh, of the pandemic. Uh, it has accelerated trends. Uh, people are McKinsey said we've jumped five years ahead of uh, where we were before. Um, there are trends that existed before that have been accelerated. You might want to talk about a few yourself. Are there any new trends? That, that were not there before, but um, that have just been created because of this chaos. And, you know, Linda's known for having said in an interview in the Financial Times that entrepreneurs need to strive in chaos. So, um, chaos is the friend of the entrepreneur. <laughs> they have to be masters of chaos. That's what you said. Yeah. Look, uh, Fred, I'll add uh, lots of things were already apparent uh, uh, to some people who were actually. Uh, uh, core believers in in the digital uh, economy uh, what what uh, what this what this crisis has done what this pandemic has done is 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 an incredible experiment uh, that got us to actually it's not only about acceleration it's about the realization of how important it is and how essential it is uh, uh, to have been completely digitally enabled I mean, this is at the core of the story. Yes, lots of things are accelerated. And yes, McKinsey will say five years. I'll say probably 10 years. I think the fourth industrial revolution that everybody talks about is sitting in our laps suddenly because of COVID. It is basically telling us, pay attention. 
throw your strategy books, whoever you are, speci specifically the big companies that were brick and mortar believers and were taking their time and addressing the challenge, whether we do digital or not digital, forget about that. You know, this thing basically has told everyone digital is the future. In my view, in my view, this generation that is coming into the workplace, everybody's worried about this generation. I think they're the luckiest generation because <laughs> we are going to build the fourth industrial revolution. This is it. So the opportunities of moving from 20th century bricks and mortar, because a lot of us were stuck in it, to the 21st century digital uh, economy is actually now suddenly right here. And there is no question about it. You don't need consultants to come and tell you you need to be digitally enabled, whether you are a country, a company, an individual, whoever you are. It sat in your face for two months when you were locked down. And, you know, the most important thing that happened in the crisis, other than us discovering everything, is that the internet was so robust. It was there for us. It did not break down when everyone was sitting on top yeah, of right. it, using it, manipulating it to the max. Nothing happened. So, which means that the backbone, the infrastructure is there. So the opportunities are going to be massive, as you just heard from your uh, from your call, and everything has got uh, accelerated. So, digital health, uh, uh, fintech, uh, edtech, uh, mobility, micro mobility. Uh, one thing new that we got to realize from this, if you want me to add a new thing, is. Uh, and I think strategically countries and companies are realizing that is the disruption of supply chains. What this did, what this did, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a logistician uh, and uh, my friend Muna will also tell you that and all the e-commerce companies will tell you that. Long supply chains were disrupted. People buying stuff from China uh, and lots of people do that, that long uh, supply chain was disrupted. So you will see the, and the, we saw this very quickly. So strategically, countries now cannot do two things on companies. You need very, very short supply chains, which means you need to be either domestically enabled to fulfill, or you, be, you need to be within a neighborhood or a region that can get you access very easily rather than you depend on very long supply chains. So in my view, you will see a redefinition of where you produce and how companies are going to mm. fulfill. So the old concept, uh, the old or new concept of just-in-time supply chains needs to be redefi redefined now because companies that did not have enough supplies were not able to fulfill uh, when business actually shot up. E-commerce companies had a spike in business. And when you have a spike in business, you need to fulfill. Otherwise, it's a missed opportunity in selling. And, and, uh, and that problem was fundamentally a supply problem. And so you will see, and you even start seeing countries now talking about the food supply chains. Do we, are we gonna be dependent on importing food from, from faraway countries? And even countries will, will start telling you, strategically, you can't take uh, uh, out uh, uh, our produce back to another country, even if you own that farm. So you will see a different set of strategic views of how countries even remain relevant and how they address their, their, their security of the state that they are in. Food security, health security. I mean, look at the healthcare issues that popped up post-crisis. Uh, post Where do you buy the ventilators from? Where do you buy your masks from? All of these things have, have gone smack in front of companies and countries. And, mm -hmm. and you will see a lot of geopolitics in this game. And, and we better be ready for this. And, co and companies are not immune to this story. Let me pick up from where Fadi said for just to, I agree with everything he said. And also this is a time when entrepreneurs also are providing a solution. We've seen in, in, in Endeavor companies around the world who had 3D printing move to print, to, to create ventilators, right? Uh, people in clothing companies pivot to, to, to provide masks. We have uh, logistics companies like Marsul in Saudi that became the national distributor of food and, and health, right? So I think that this is again an area where entrepreneurs are going to get there faster than the older um, less agile companies. But just to, 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 to add to the new trends, in addition to the supply chain issues Fadi's mentioned, number one, I think this we are reimagining work. And I think that when people go back to work, 
no one is going to go back five days a week to large office buildings with high elevators, right? And have to take public transportation. <laughs> and therefore, all of the restaurants, all of the ancillary, you know, businesses, I'm very mm. worried about that. What's the future of, of retail businesses surrounding, uh, you know, uh, office buildings? What is the future of commercial real estate? You know, is anyone else, you know, what's the future of business travel? How many of us are going to say, I'm not going for that board meeting. You know, I'm, I can do it on Zoom. We did it before. So I think all of these things, when we come out of this, we're going to have to see what goes back and what actually is the new normal a lot more, you know, online. And the other thing is you talk to any parent and while ed tech is fine, great, we love Zoom, we know, we know the founders of Zoom very well and Endeavor Entrepreneur was their first investor. However, Zoom school, not ready for prime time. <laughs> Ask mm. any parent. So this is 1.0 in digital education and unless it gets better, parents are really having a hard time, you know, having to homeschool and work at home and have kids running through and, and having the bandwidth, you know, being taken by their videos. And so all our screens go in and out. So I think that, that parenting and working is also going to need readjusting. Yeah. Fatty and I are, are lucky to have our children out of, out of the, out of our legs right now, but you let, let me add twins one thing. that are still with you. Fred, let me add one thing that, that I think is essential for us is that suddenly also, uh, the regulators and the policymakers uh, uh, globally and specifically in the regions that uh, were having challenges in having that uh, uh, serious and transparent dialogue with regulators, uh, that the regulators have, have, uh, are, are going to have to run very quickly now to catch up, uh, uh, specifically on fintech and specifically on education. I'll give you an example of, of how, how this could be positively done. Look, Saudi Arabia two weeks ago, Saudi Arabia two weeks ago, and this is so essential, for the first time has approved and certified that if you have an online degree, it is a certifiable degree. Because before that, they would say you need to have to go to a physical university before we can certify your degree. Now they caught up so quickly and they said, if you've taken degrees and if you are gonna get a degree online, then you're gonna be certified as if you went to a university or to a college or to whatever. So, you know, this is so essential. And Saudi Arabia, I'll give you another example. In the crisis, decided that e-commerce companies cannot accept cash on delivery. So no more movement of cash. The, the, the e-commerce businesses have been for years trying to tell clients, please pay online. And then suddenly the regulator comes up and says, you know, no cash because cash is, you know, contagious, whatever, you will have stuff in it. And so what happened? Suddenly, uh, fintech and online payments and digital payments took up and people wanted to pay with credit cards and the whole ecosystem changed and the regulator was actually ahead of the companies in this time. So uh, the world has turned upside down and, and lots of things are happening and, and we, you know, entrepreneurs and other than entrepreneurs are going to be uh, having a field day building the future. And, and let's, let me just add one more thing, which we'll get to the investor question later, is that these great companies are not just cropping up in the U.S. and China anymore, which Fadi and I have known for years, but it, oh, the world is surprised. We're seeing some of the best fintech companies in the world coming out of Dubai, checkout.com, uh, Nigeria, Flutterwave, Paga. We're seeing digital banks being born out of Brazil. I think we're seeing Indonesia, Singapore. It is a global, we know entrepreneurship is global, but now these fintech solutions, these other solutions, really we're gonna see platforms really taking taking over what the what the traditional businesses and governments were doing at a faster rate than ever before. This is that's why your audience was right to say this is positive for entrepreneurship. I'm, I'm loving this conversation. I mean, in, in, in these times, uh, the positivity that's coming out of the, of the discussion and, and the audience that seems to be also on the side of positivity is, is really welcome. In, in, Not the uh, investors. Everybody else positive. Now, let's talk <laughs> about the investors. Uh, let's talk about the investors because I see there's a lot of questions that are coming in and we need to get to them and we need to get, bring Mona on as well. Um, so investors, Prequin says that there's about $1.5 trillion of dry powder in private equity in VC around the world. Um, apparently in the US, there's $150 billion just in venture capital that's ready to be invested. About half of that is earmarked for um, existing companies, but the other half, $75 billion to, to be invested into new deals. 
So um, how is that going to pan out? Um, where, what's the responsibility of investors uh, moving forwards? And um, are their approach going to change in the post-COVID era? Who wants to take that? Fadi, maybe Fadi? Uh, look, investors uh, are what, what their name is. They're investors. That's what they exist for. So uh, whoever says investors don't invest, it, does, it means they're not investors. So let's define that. <laughs> we are in the business of investors. <laughs> <laughs> but so let's... Uh, uh, but in the crisis, uh, Fred, everybody was busy. We were busy uh, uh, helping companies bridge the, the, the cash flow gap, right? Some companies were flying high anyway, so, uh, or were lucky uh, that have raised maybe six months before the crisis. But those who haven't, who were already a viable, a viable companies, already growing, already having, uh, having uh, uh, serious products that uh, have adoption, uh, we needed to make sure that uh, they are going to survive this crisis because they're very viable. Others will die anyway. Others would have vanished anyway. Uh, uh, but but uh, uh, that's what investors did. There was a firefighting mode. We had lots of time to discuss with our companies how they can actually go through this crisis and how we can help them do that. But everybody was preparing themselves for actually getting uh, their rounds, go, uh, getting new rounds of investment uh, going. And those who've done well in the crisis are going to get a lot of attention. And we already see that uh, uh, from a lot of investors waiting for the opportunity. So there is no question uh, uh, about that, uh, Fred. There you are also starting to see suddenly uh, uh, the traditional investors who didn't think that they should invest in digital. Uh, governments who thought uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, you can't wait on it. Sovereign wealth funds, you need to invest in the infrastructure and then the entrepreneurial ecosystems in your own countries also. So you will, you, I'm, I'm starting to see it in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, everywhere. The story is uh, we might have missed an opportunity. We want to go into it. Or those who have already been there, we're doubling down. And, and we, we, uh, some of us are saying, we told you so. Right, so I can I can say that we told you so. You shouldn't have missed it because that it was it was there, and COVID has 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 highlighted it. Linda, you want to say something? Yeah, let me add, and and I should say that Endeavor we have two hundred and thirty million dollars under management now for Endeavor Catalyst, mm. where we co-invest in Endeavor entrepreneurs. So we we follow leads like Fadi, um, and 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 others in VC and private equity. And we've never been busier than this quarter. So I, we just closed our first uh, investment in Nigeria in Flutterwave, one of the fintech companies I was imagining. We've 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 closed more rounds in this last six period than in the prior uh, couple of uh, uh, quarters. So I I agree that the great opportunities are are actually presenting themselves more than ever before. I'll just add two things. One is that I do think the era of grow at all costs, don't worry about profitability, the, you know, the soft bank vision fund, we just want to grow, 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 is, is changing. Even I was talking with Marcelo Clare, who runs WeWork, who's the uh, chairman of, of, of SoftBank International. Even for them, they're pivoting to wanting a path to profitability as well. That is not bad for entrepreneurs, right? You have to, going back to what Fadi said in the beginning, be mindful of cash. And so I really think the strongest leaders are going to come out. The second thing is the fake VCs are going to go away. That's not a bad thing either. Anyone who mm. was an investment banker who pretended that they were a VC, they're not investors. The people who have gone through the challenges before, the people who know what it's like to hire and fire people and still maintain culture, the people who have had operating experience, those are the people we want to become the funders because they really get this from a visceral perspective and not just looking at the, you know, at the financials at the, at the end of the uh, deck. But the third point, and I think this is really interesting from what I'm seeing in, in the US, is you know, in Endeavor, we've believed in global entrepreneurship for 22 years since that cab ride in, in Buenos Aires uh, back in the mid 1990s. And no, I was chica loca. I was the crazy girl, even in the Middle East, for suggesting that we're entrepreneurs that you could invest in and grow and make money. And now, and what the Silicon Valley folks always said is, well, we don't invest in any place where we can't ride our bike to. That is over. 
because none of those Silicon Valley investors are in Silicon Valley now. They're in Aspen. <laughs> They're in, you know, Utah skiing. Mm -hmm. They are no longer. So what's the difference if you're going to invest via Zoom, investing from Aspen to Silicon Valley or investing in a company in Dubai or in Indonesia or in Kenya? or in Brazil. So I think that they're now having to rethink their entire excuse for why they weren't investing more broadly. And I believe we're gonna see a change. Good, good. Let's bring it. And I'll add one thing. Let, let me add a, a, a little bit of what Linda, to build on what Linda had said on, on, the, on the blitz scaling, uh, what our, our, our friend Reed right. Hoffman says, I had, right. I had a discussion with, with, with some of his colleagues on, on blitz scaling and, and there is, uh, and uh, you need to ask Muna about this, the whole model of e-commerce and, and companies has become so efficient now because everybody's buying online. It has proven that those companies who are well managed actually can make money. For those of the people that said, you know, you're not gonna make money in, in e-commerce, you're not gonna do that because you're spending a lot of money on advertising so that you can uh, do your customer acquisition. Suddenly, you know, and I'm invested in a lot of e-commerce companies, most of them are starting to see profitability suddenly, you know, sudden uh, efficiencies and effectiveness in how they actually conduct themselves online. It is staggering how, how this thing has shifted the mind, the mindset into, into thinking, yes, we can grow the business and we can make money at the same time. Before okay. we get to that, though, I think one more important point to add, you know, there's a reckoning in the United States in particular around, particularly after the George Floyd, you know, incidents really brought to light the, the police brutality that has been um, taking place against African American men for, you know, centuries. But um, I, a lot of VCs are realizing that only 2% of VC dollars go to women and only 1% go to, you know, black founders in the US, but let's just, and what we see is there are phenomenal entrepreneurs like Mona and like other female founders, Proximy I mentioned, based on love. And where are the funders? Why, and I think that this is the other thing we're gonna see is we need diverse funders who are excellent to get more venture financing because it really, the numbers tell, the data tell a story and, and I think there is a reckoning. So I do think that VCs need to look beyond the, you know, the boys and hoodies <laughs> that they, uh, you know, engineering that they, that they tend to invest in and open their minds to a broader set of founders. Interesting. Um, so we've been talking about Mona. You've all mentioned Mona. We need to bring Mona. Mona, can you please join us? Um, Mona is the uh, founder of Mums World. Um, that was started in 2011 and it's um it's a bilingual online marketplace that's catering for mother baby and child products um all over the all, all over the middle east from newborns to to about 12 years old um are you with us mona i'm right here yes it's ah, that's great um so mona you've been hearing the conversation i'd love to just bring in your reaction like this off the cuff uh, they've been talking about uh, investors, talking about uh, the pandemic, the everything's going digital. Um, Fadi said that when uh, you, you, you would talk to the fact that, you know, you can become profitable even under, under a crisis uh, when, when your company is, is well managed. So tell us, tell us what you think about the, these comments so far. So um, thank you for, for having me here. So definitely... Um, a pandemic has a, a mixed bag of gains and, and losses and a tremendous amount of, of opportunity. We are in e-commerce. Um, e-commerce before the pandemic represented less than 2% of retail. And suddenly, uh, overnight almost, um, that 2% went to practically 100%. So while um, demand is great, at the end of the day, um, e-commerce is complex. Um, it's dependent on a supply chain that actually works. It depends on um, enablers in the ecosystem that can allow you to fulfill that increased demand. Um, courier, um, couriers that have the capacity, payment gateways that work, uh, resources and talent that can actually be mobilized to cater to the customer. All of that almost overnight fell apart. 
Um, Fadi mentioned earlier the supply chain. So if you have an increased demand, you need increased uh, supply. But the reality is with blockages in travel, um, with suppliers closing down, that supply chain came to an immediate halt. Um, so for us as e-commerce players, we needed to be agile. Uh, we needed to be creative. We needed to figure out um, ways to cater to that demand um, without kind of losing that opportunity. Um, I think, you know, Fadi mentioned cash on delivery earlier. We were actually the first players in the region within two weeks of the lockdown to say we're not delivering cash on delivery anymore because it's too risky. Uh, we were the first, I think, very early on that said, you know what, the supply chain is going to be impacted. So how can we double up on our own private labels? Um, and then our team, we mobilize our team working remotely with systems and operations that would allow us to continue to cater to the customer. So again, it comes back to how agile are you, um, how quickly can you move, and how much buy-in do you get from your team? And I know this is something that was mentioned earlier. You know, your team is your business. Your team drives success. Um, uh, the team that's motivated, that's, success, that's, um, that's creative, and that feels that we are uh, riding this wave of tremendous opportunity. And if we're able to ride that wave and come out from the other side, then the future looks very, very bright. Um, the last thing I'll mention also, I jotted down about profitability. Um, you know, uh, Linda said it, I think entrepreneurs in times of challenge um, need to be smarter, they need to be more creative, um, and they need to figure out ways to be more efficient. And I always say that the most difficult times are the ones that bring out the best in you. So we were able to drive to profitability very early on in the pandemic um, and figure out ways that we were operating with inefficiencies before um, and learn ways that we can take this forward so that post pandemic, we would operate as a different business or as a better business. Mm. So thanks, Mona. Yeah, so I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball here. Um, uh, none of you are sort of expecting this, I think, and, and you may actually not have an answer. We need to we need to understand baseball when you say curveball. What, what does that mean? <laughs> curveball? A curveball is a very hard ball to to bat back, uh, right, Linda? You you you're more you know more about baseball than I do. I'm sure. We're in Red Sox territory right now. <laughs> but look, um, a lot of a lot of talk about e-commerce businesses doing well, if they can pivot, if they can readjust, whatever, you know, that's sort of, I think, a given. But there are, there are also some businesses that may not be able to do that. Um, and I know that in the WAMDA, for example, portfolio, you have a bus company in Turkey, uh, a bus service company. Um, in, um, in Endeavor, in Nigeria, you have a entrepreneur who runs uh, cinemas. Um, and movie theaters. Um, it, how have these, I, I mean, I don't know if these two examples uh, resonate with you, but uh, are these companies going to basically maybe need to uh, fold up and start something new, or have they actually been able to reposition themselves and, and orchestrate that pivot? Look, as oh. Mona said, it, it, there, are, there are positives and there are negatives, and there are certain industries, the, the, on, the travel industry, both online and offline, has taken a real hit. I mentioned restaurants, very hard. Now, some of them are pivoting to online delivery. We have a chain of coffee shops in Indonesia that raised $109 million from Sequoia a few weeks ago, so unbelievable, pivoted, pivoted everything on, offline. But yeah, I am, I am worried about certain sectors for sure. At the same time, you listen to Mona, and Mona, it's not a surprise that Mum's World was able to pivot to pop profitability, pivot to you know no cash on demand, we've got to use online, because Mona knew her unit economics better than almost any other entrepreneur I've met you know, for a decade, right? And I think this is the test of leadership too. And so I do think that it's not only um, the opportunities that are facing Mum's World, it's that what Mona and her team and what other entrepreneurs and what we're seeing is even in industries which you would expect people to fail, really good leadership, really good teams, the creativity and agility that she spoke of can actually allow people to pivot when you, when they, you wouldn't otherwise expect them to. Fadi? So, so the, look, Fred, as I said earlier, 
these people, uh, the Vault Lines in, in Istanbul and another company that we had invested in, uh, uh, Vault Lines is, I think, an endeavor entrepreneur. Yeah. Initially. Yeah. His pivot and he continued that. And we've invested in a micro, uh, in a in a uh, in a micro mobility company called Marty, also in in Turkey, which is an an, an endeavor entrepreneur uh, uh, at the same time. Look, what happened with these people is they got disrupted for two three months, they, and they had viable businesses. They will pivot. They will find a way, and they are already finding a way to stay relevant. What we needed to do with them is to bridge them. So that if they had cash flow issues, so that they could get to, to the time when, uh, when things go back to normal. So a company like Marty, for instance, which is um, the micro mobility company in Istanbul, uh, moved from uh, practically zero uh, utilization during the lockdown, obviously, uh, to uh, the past two weeks actually peaking at even higher than pre-COVID uh, uh, utility because, because people now probably didn't want to go uh, in public transportation, but they actually wanted to use the scooters because they probably felt that the scooter is an easier and a safer way for them to actually move around the city like, uh, you know, a busy city like Istanbul where, where public transportation is super, is super crowded. Same thing with Vault Lines. Vault Lines provides uh, bus transportation for companies. So they were able to handle themselves in being relevant so that their employees don't go with public transportation but can go with safer uh, uh, buses that are managed uh, and much more in tune with the requirements of social distancing. So look, uh, uh, yes, people will have a challenge. Some business models cannot pivot. Uh, and so people, uh, these entrepreneurs have to We're either- drive in uh, movie theaters though. Drive-ins are coming back, so. Yeah, well, <laughs> Everybody will find a way. You know, the, the, whole, the entrepreneurial mindset is a, is a solution mindset. So that's how they think. Some of them will not be able to actually re-emerge, but others will re-emerge. So, uh, I mean, this is, the, this is the nature of the world anyway. Mona, we're going to bring you in also. We've got a lot of questions here. So I, I suggest we, we just go in. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to uh, read a few out like that. We can, uh, and they're coming from all over the world. Um, so let me just throw out two or three, okay? Um, there's one from the audience. Uh, it says, many startups were in their initiation phase just pre-COVID. They were just starting to stand on their feet. What would these new startups do as they were never ready for this situation? They were not even sure if they would do well in a normal environment. So that's one question. There's a question from Canada. Uh, in what ways must economic stimulus packages be modified in order for them to be more inclusive towards low-income minority group business owners. Fadi, with your article, recent op-ed that you wrote, you may want to answer, answer that one. Just wait, I'm going to have one more. Question from the UK. Why do you think entrepreneurs thrive in chaos? Is it because the normal situation is thrown out of the room and cozy relationships with the usual suspects are broken? Um, so we've got three questions there. I, I think Fadi, maybe the one uh, from Canada on the economic stimulus packages. Um, so, Mo, maybe you want to answer the first one, which was on, um, uh, you know, some small startups just pre-COVID, just standing on their feet. What should they do now? And, and, and chaos. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're you're known as the entrepreneur whisperer, also by ABC News. So you can take the the chaos, the I'll chaos. Mona. So um, the uh, two, two comments uh, to that. One is um, we're seeing a lot of uh, collaboration and consolidation. So what's going to happen now is um, an idea that is a customer-centric idea that's solving a customer need. Um, and you have experts who kind of have figured out how to do it. Um, you're going to see con a collaboration and consolidation of expertise. Um, and I think what's going to happen coming out of this wave of COVID is you're going to have um, kind of pieces of the puzzle coming together to, to make a large organization much, much bigger because you have experts uh, kind of collaborating. So the, the answer to kind of the small startups, if they have figured out a customer-centric offering that um, potentially has good fundamentals and good unit economics, and they're able to tap into a larger player who can give them access to an ecosystem, then there might be you know, some magic happening over there. So, um, you know, we work with a lot of um, 
smaller entities that have a specialized expertise, we benefit and they benefit. Um, again, at, at the end of the day, whether it's pre-COVID, during COVID or post-COVID, the, the fundamentals remain the same. Do you have something that is uh, customer centric? Do you have the resources that allow you to figure that out? And are you able to maneuver through the maze today, this, this pandemic maze, um, and kind of get to that customer. And, and again, no, uh, no maze is different. Today's, uh, today's ecosystem, although it's a pandemic ecosystem, is still very different than it was a decade ago, and then it will be a decade from today. Thank you, Mona. Uh, Fadi, on, um, on the economic stimulus package, I guess the roles of, uh, also the role of government, right? I mean, well, uh, well, uh, I, what I meant in my, uh, in my uh, uh, article that I wrote a few days ago is, look, SMEs, I, I, I wasn't only talking about digital companies because there are the restaurants, there are the people that are already uh, had thriving businesses in, in one way or another. That those that need a cash flow bridge to get them to, to back to, to, to work so that you can preserve these jobs that uh, were lost, uh, support these entrepreneurs. My idea is government should step in and ease the pain of these people in cash flow because all that problem is cash flow. It's not their viability. If they have a viable business, provide loans that are guaranteed by government so that these people can actually continue to employ. My, my concept on this, and this is, I mean, it's not mine, what I wrote in there, is that this is a partnership between government and the private sector because SMEs are the private sector. So if you are going to support them now in the crisis so that they stay relevant and continue to operate, then the cycle of the economic cycle and the engine of growth of SMEs, because SMEs are actually the biggest engine uh, of, of employment in any economy. You're basically investing in the country, you're investing in the economy by uh, putting uh, liquidity and money and cash in the pockets of, uh, of, these, uh, of these employees, of these people, so that they can go back and spend. They have to pay their rent, they have to pay uh, uh, their uh, uh, tuition for their uh, children, they have to buy food, etc. So uh, uh, the point is... Uh, this is not charity at the end of the day, and this is not about uh, 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 feeling that uh, it's a burden. It is about investing in the economy so that it continues to thrive. It's a because, mindset change. Mindset change. Yes, because, because, and that's how governments should think. You are investing in these people so that they give you back. I mean, there's a return of investment by, by making the economy thrive again. Uh, uh, so it's short-term investment for long-term survivability. Thank you. Linda, on chaos? Yeah, before I get to chaos, let me just add to what Fadi said, which is of one of the government, when you look at Singapore, they are providing a stimulus where they're covering 75% of SME jobs for 10 months, including expats. And I think especially in places like Dubai, where there are a lot of expats, I think that that is a model that one could continue. We have the payroll protection program in the US, but I don't think that's working as well as what Singapore is doing for a longer period of time to, to, get, to make sure people aren't, uh, aren't you know, uh, releasing jobs on, on the chaos front. Okay. So yes, I believe that chaos is the friend of the entrepreneur because entrepreneurs to Mona's point are more creative and more agile and the larger companies are stepping back are probably, uh, firing people, what they call synergies, which means letting people go and, and, and really freaking out about their lack of digitization. Whereas I think that so I think that entrepreneurs have a head start. And what's really important is we haven't really talked about the labor market. Um, I'm on a board of an Endeavor company based out of Argentina called Globant. It's public on the New York Stock Exchange. And before it used to be, how can we attract talent to Argentina? Well, today, forget that. They have uh, uh, talent not only throughout Latin America, but in Romania, in Belarus, in <laughs> India, in the US, right? So I think the world is now global. Again, back to people not needing to go to a physical office space. So, and what else you have is I've been joking that all these millennials want to know what the perks are of businesses and that, you know, are there free massages? Is there free food? And I've been joking that, no, 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 the job is the perk. <laughs> but having said that, um, and I do think there's a mindset change, I think that entrepreneurs also have something up to offer in terms of giving people a sense of agency, a sense of belonging to something bigger themselves, and a sense of a cause. And there is a common 
purpose that many entrepreneurs can harness to attract the best talent to build and co-create the future, back to what we were discussing at the beginning. So I think for all these reasons, this is a time for entrepreneurs to gain market share, to gain talent, and not see themselves as the underdogs without those ties to the, you know, to the government and to the big connections. Thanks a lot. I, um, we're running, we're soon running out of time. So I want to quickly bring out that poll again, that first question. I, I'd like us to ask the audience after having followed this conversation um, to have another vote on, on, the same, on the same question, which is, you know, how will the post COVID-19 world impact entrepreneurship? Is it negative? Will it be positively or nothing will change? Um, and as you are uh, entering your answers, I will quickly throw in, I think we're going to go for some 30 second responses here. We have a question from the UAE talking about uh, the fact that there's a, apparently a new generation uh, of greatly, um, we noticed the new generation is greatly exposed to entrepreneurship. Is this an indicator that we are about to witness a major shift in market players? Um, and, you know, I, that was a question I had in the back of my mind, too, because uh, studies have shown that most entrepreneurial businesses are created by people between the age of 40 or 52 years old. Do we think this might change? Um, yeah, I'll take that quickly. So when I started, you know, Endeavor 22 years ago, there was no word for entrepreneur in most languages used, not in Spanish, Portuguese, Turkish, really not in Arabic. Fadi and I co-chaired the World Economic Forum uh, that you were part of, uh, Fred, in, in the MENA region in 2007. And we started talking about entrepreneurs and people came up to us and said, what the heck are you talking about? And I'm not leaving my safe <laughs> corporate job. That has completely shattered. So the answer is yes. We're going to see this new generation taking over. Okay. Um, there's a question about the future of retail. What do you think about the future of retail? I think we touched on that, right? I mean, it, that's going to be well, one of the future of retail is online, offline. There is, th this is what the future of retail is. Every retailer who has a physical uh, uh, bricks and mortar should have a robust digital uh, uh, presence. Not, uh, uh, by the way, you know, yes, we can sell you online. They have to go both together. Okay, and I, I sense here the next question is from an entrepreneur who's uh, wanting some advice here, uh, asking um, what ways will customer experiences be changed uh, after COVID-19? Um, are they, what are the change, what, what changes are going to, how are, how are the buying patterns going to be influenced? Mona, you want to give that a shot? So the customer of today during COVID is looking mostly at essentials. Um, we've all seen that because they're unsure of the future, they're unsure of their financial status quo, even tomorrow. So they're, they're buying the essentials, they're buying uh, smart and, and more conservative. Um, that's today. Um, the, the customer of tomorrow, we've seen kind of the entry to that even before COVID. And that is this whole notion of the world of customers is about, um, uh, transparency about immediate gratification, uh, authenticity, um, and convenience. So the customer wants to make sure that she has, she's empowered to make informed decisions with the transparency, with choice, and immediate gratification. So whether it's e-commerce or m-commerce, the, the company or brand that's going to win is the one that can kind of be by the side of the customer um, uh, faster and easier and more conveniently. Fantastic. Now, let me, let's see if we can ask um, for the results of the poll um, that we, we just had there. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, each of you to prepare your, your 20 second, uh, 25 second goodbye, uh, so long comments. Uh, let's see if we can get uh, the poll results. Okay. Well, we've moved from 63% to 87%. So uh, before Mona, I think you saw the results. There was only there was 63% of uh, of the audience was positive uh, about um, you know entrepreneurship in the post COVID era. So that number's gone up. Uh, nothing. The pessimists have not moved, um, and uh, we've had a good impact on those that were uh, negative about uh, uh, about the future. Good. So Linda, off to you. No, it's great to be here. We've seen incredibly 
um, entrepreneurial p uh, founders coming out of emerging markets and growth markets for 20 years. And I believe in the next de decade, some of the most important businesses in the world will be founded in this crisis. Fantastic. Fadi? Uh, and I think uh, the future is here, Fred. It has arrived. Everything that everybody has been talking about that is going to happen in the next 10 years, it's here. Everybody better be ready for it. So governments, citizens, schools, uh, uh, companies, uh, investors, you name it. The opportunity of building uh, the next wave uh, of, of, uh, of, of the digital economies is, is here and uh, the opportunities are fantastic. I think uh, it's going to take a, a while to do that, but uh, uh, it is going to be, I think, uh, as good as, as the Industrial Revolution moved people out of poverty and into a new wave. So skill sets are changing and this next generation that is digitally native is going to be the biggest beneficiary of this. Fadi, maybe you'd like to be 50 years younger. No, I'm happy where I am. You know, uh, <laughs> the 60s nowadays is the, is the old 30s. Right? <laughs> and you'd better believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Mona. So how, how do I go after that? Um, I mean, I think for me, what I would say is it's a time of positive disruption. Uh, businesses that can have positive um, socioeconomic impact um, are the ones that are going to thrive. And um, if you're an entrepreneur with a vision and you have the courage to kind of run towards that vision, um, it's going to be exciting times uh, post this, uh, this wave. So good thank time. You. So, look, I'd like to thank all three of you. Um, we're short with time. I'm going to hand back to Reem, who's been our host here at the World Government Summit. Um, I want to thank you very much for um, this uh, active conversation. I, I am going to hang up being very encouraged and very positive about uh, this post-COVID era. We're going to do great things all together. Reem. Thank you, Fred. Um, Fred, Linda, Fadi, Mona, I think um, what has made this session so interesting uh, is everyone coming from a similar but different backgrounds. And we've had such a global audience also at the same time. Uh, the poll is really a definition of how uh, we do have an optimistic audience and hopefully an optimistic uh, group of entrepreneurs and investors, Linda, can <laughs> bring you that back on. So um, I think um, moving forward, we just need to really look at the opportunities ahead. And I think, Mona, adding to your point of courage, I think it's a time where we need to be courageous. And Fadi, going back to your final point, that we need governments and regulation and everyone to all of us collectively work together. There is a lot of opportunity. It's for us to actually leap onto those opportunities and take them forward. Thank you so much for this lovely session. And on behalf of everyone, stay safe and we hope to see you all soon. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, Linda. Bye. Bye, Linda. Bye, Fadi. Bye, Mona. Bye, Fred. Thank you. Bye, Mona.